This meeting is being recorded. Folks, we need to have an adult conversation. I'm going to give you something here that is uh, not uh, not popular. And that is uh, that index investing, the lazy man's way to investing in stocks is dead for the next couple of years. I believe index investing is a guaranteed way to um, not get a great return in a world of easy money being over. Uh, You're going to see good operators win. Now, finding good operators is difficult, as is all investing. But yeah, uh, and have this conversation. I brought on Taylor from Life Goal Investments, a 10-year Wall Street veteran. Uh, Taylor, man, index investing was all the rage for the last 10, 20, 30 years. I think it's dead for a couple of years as the good operators win and everybody else struggles. What do you think? Yeah, index investing has been a great way to invest for the past, call it 15 years. And well, not quite 15. Let's go back to 2008. And and the reason it's been such a good way to invest is because since 2008, interest rates have been at zero. Right. What, what does that what does that do for companies? It allows anybody on the planet to go out and say, hey, I want to borrow money because I think I can make incrementally more for my investor based on that really low cost of capital. Well, guess what? That low cost of capital is gone. And, and, and let's let's use it in layman's terms. Like, let's look at a mortgage. Everyone knows that mortgage rates have skyrocketed. Well, that same thing is playing out for companies that are going out to try to borrow money as well, whether it's building out a factory, whether it's paying employees, whatever it may be, that cost of capital has dramatically increased to a multiple of like four times as expensive it was at the beginning of this year. Yeah. This is really a difficult conversation for me because I know most people don't like to do the work. Yeah. Uh, Most people like the easy button. So again, you know, I, I think index investing is better than sitting in cash. But I have to tell you, the people that do the work, the people that are like Warren Buffett, they read for hours of the day, they go out and find the good operators. Um, they're like Charlie Munger says, they get a little focused, they watch the basket. They're going to crush it. I think, yeah. I think the active Wall Street analyst is going to make their money. There will be a couple of all-stars, not Kathy Wood. Kathy Wood got lucky, lucky with timing. <laughs> Oh Jeez. my lord. That is that is an epic, epic un- unravel there. And I, I think there's no doubt about it. And I think that people need to to go back to thinking about okay, what is it I want from investing? Is it is it do I want the lowest cost option? Because the lowest cost option is always going to be an index product. You can get them for two, three basis points. Fidelity at one point was putting them out at, at, at zero cost. I'm not sure if that's still the case or not. But anyway, there's certainly the lowest cost opportunity out there, which is index investing. But I think what you need to understand is that even when you talk about the market as a whole, it's not just stocks, right? There's bonds, there's real estate, there's commodities. Again, you know, we talked about in the last episode, everything got smoked this year, but we didn't talk about the fact that commodities didn't get smoked. Yeah. You know, so if you had commodity exposure, you know, so, you know, namely oil, if you had oil exposure, that helped your portfolio hold up through a really tough time. But guess what? You're not getting oil exposure. In VOO, the Vanguard S and P 500 index, right? You're getting a, a touch of oil exposure via whatever company is held there, but you aren't getting enough exposure there to help you offset a really brutal market for Apple, for Tesla, for Amazon down 50%. You know, just these massive, massive areas of the market that are totally overvalued that have been propped up by that low cost of capital. That's not there anymore. Yeah, I think 2023 when you do index investing, you're you're I, I, you know, it's going to be 20% rock stars, 60%, eh, and, you know, 20% dead. You're, you're just not going to go anywhere. Yeah. So it's going to so, be very much about doing the work and finding those players. So, so let's like, let's look at some things and, and how they reacted over the last year and where there might be some value in the market. One, we talked a lot about bonds in the last episode, and I think that there's a lot of value in bonds that hasn't been there in some time. Yeah, or, we we talked, for- what was it? Two, two months ago, and I said, damn it, I'm going to go buy some uh, 10-year treasuries at 4.6. What a great trade that was. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, you've already seen yield compression, yeah. which has caused the price to go up. That was a up. great trade. Yeah, absolutely. So let's let's talk about like real estate. So when you look at the when you look at the earnings that real estate REITs, real estate investment trusts, which are a sector within the S&P 500, they were added five years ago. They were, you know, it became the, the final sector that that's, was added. Um, so REITs this year have produced earnings growth of 15.5% is what they should come in at the end of the year at. That says a little estimate baked in there, but nonetheless, 15%, call it somewhere right in that ballpark. Yet REITs this year are down 26%. 
So you look at that and you go, okay, maybe that's something that could see some reversion back up. And when you look at REITs historically, what you understand is that as inflation builds, REITs get pummeled because they right. have cost of capital associated with them. But what actually happens over time as inflation plays out, and as you hit that peak and start to come back down, is you see that REITs have the ability yeah. to pass through that cost of capital increase mm -hmm. to the renters at the end of the yeah. day. And we all yes. know that at the yeah. end of the day, rents are going up right now. And guess who's the benefactor of that? The REIT yeah, what, what is? I don't know very many REITs. The only REIT that I really follow is Simon Properties, right? Which is yep. a class A mall operator. Uh, yep. Can you throw out a couple of more REITs? Maybe just uh, no, no, no. Um, yeah, you're not you're yeah. not saying good or bad. Just a few. Yeah. So there's there's you know Starwood Properties. There's MGM. There's there's a lot of companies out there that are REIT operators. And again, I think what you have to understand is that it's not all REITs are created equal either. You have to look within the REIT. Is this mm -hmm. office space? If it's office space, do you want that? I don't know. Now maybe probably there's not, some reversion. Not yet. Back. Yeah, not yet. Exactly. Because I do think the return to work yeah. thing is actually going to play out. But that said, there are New York City high rises that are vacant right now because San no one's Francisco, sitting in the office. San Francisco occupancy is 32%. There are <laughs> office buildings going back what? to the bank. 32%? Yeah. Occupied. They're going back to Yikes. the bank. You just can't operate an office building at 32%. Yep, exactly. But what about bank. fulfillment centers? Oh no! You think yeah. people are going to start start getting less delivered by mail? I don't think that trend's going away. And that's that's not a COVID thing. That's not a uh, you know that's a ease and simplicity of life thing. Or how about retail properties? How about you know are, are we in a housing shortage at this point? Yes, I think that's anyone's argument. You know, it would be tough to say that we're not at an absolute shortage of housing. You know better than I do. And with that, is there price control by the owner of that facility? Yes. Yeah because there is no alternative. They can't go elsewhere because they can't get financing right now at, an, at, a, at a reasonable cost. Yeah. Yeah, so I think, again, I think when you look at, um, you know, who are the good, like historically speaking, stock pickers, right? Obviously Warren Buffett has done his thing. Most people know him, but highlight some others and maybe some books if you happen to remember the titles. Because again, I think the next couple of years, it's about, finding those stock pickers or companies or whatever you want to call it. Who, who would you kind of highlight is a, a couple of people to go research? Yeah. So like a Peter Lynch is a great stock picker over time. Um, he made his name at Fidelity with the Magellan fund, which ballooned to something like a hundred billion dollars or something. Back don't a hundred billion dollars was real. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. Back when, back when a hundred billion dollars was real, not, not Tesla funny money. Right. And then I, I always go back to this and you know who I'm going to go to as my favorite investor of all time, Ray Dalio. Ray Dalio is my favorite investor of all time. And, and, and to me, I'm going to kind of twist your words a little bit. My thing is not stock picking. Um, I think that very, very few people should pick stocks. I think that it's a game that uh, takes a lot of work, takes a lot of research, as you've alluded to several times here. And I think that to put in the work, there you go. Exactly right. Go. And that's something that a lot of people don't want to do. And, and, and maybe it's because they don't have time. Maybe it's because they don't have interest. Maybe because they don't have the expertise. But at the end of the day, what Ray Dalio does on top of stock picking is he creates that diversified basket. Yeah. He creates that diversified basket called the all weather product. So Ray Dalio runs the largest hedge fund in the world. And hedge fund is where Rich smart water. Bridgewater Capital, exactly right. Mm -hmm. So Bridgewater, the name of that portfolio that is the largest hedge fund, the one fund within it. Now they have several funds, um, but the biggest one is the all weather product. And why is it the biggest one? Because in 2008, it was positive 8%. Now Warren Buffett, to all his credit, one of the greatest stock pickers of all time, was down 27% that year. So what does smart money look for? They look for less of this, more of this that consistency, slow growth, because what does that allow you to do? The important thing when it comes to investing at the end of the day is putting the maximum amount of money you have to work in a product where you can withstand the tough times. And so if you can put 90% of your money to work, markets go up over time, stock, bond, commodity, real estate, all markets go up over time. So you want to be in the game, but you can't be in the game and take a drawdown of 50%, of even 27%. That's something that most people can't stomach. So at the end of the day, if Ray Dalio can put together a product that's up 8%, now granted, he doesn't have the 20% compounding annual rate that, uh, that, that Warren Buffett has. He's actually compounded annually right about 10%. So Warren Buffett's going to be richer than him at the end of the day, but people can't keep their butt in the seat through the yeah. tough time. We're showing he will that sleep right better than what, yeah. 
That's exactly right. The average person, uh, I mean, it's it's pretty well documented, buys at the top and sells at the bottom. And it's because Every time. You know, Warren Buffett's gift is, you know, the, the, what I give Warren Buffett credit for and investors like him is he really does believe in the, when there's blood in the street, go all in. Right. I still remember the the terms he got from Goldman Sachs. Oh, he just put them in a headlock back in 2008. I got yeah. the cash. You don't. Yep. You need me. I don't need you. He not only yeah, got I like believe eight, he infused 10, 10 billion to them. I think it was in yeah, 2008 billion, at a time got, where go ahead. Go ahead. No, I think he got eight percent coupon and he got some rights to more stock later. I mean, he made like a gazillion dollars off that one thing and from yeah, Goldman exactly. Sachs. Exactly right. From not not a stupid operator themselves oh, in Goldman Sachs, it was just a best. point of stress, right? It was a point of stress where we didn't know, you know, you 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 probably even remember this a little bit more vividly than I do. I was around at that point, but I wasn't as deep into the weeds as I am now. In 2008, that was a period of time where you didn't know legitimately if our banking system was going to hold no. up. Yeah, the, I remember the day vividly uh, where there was a. Um... There was, I, I forget what it was called, a mutual fund, I think, that broke the buck, right? The money, there was a money market yep, account yep, that broke yep, the buck. Yep. I'm like, money markets shit. are supposed to always maintain a $1 value, always yeah. maintain a $1 value. And there's a little coupon. So that's yeah. the, that's the intent of them. Yeah. And, the, and, and it broke to like 97 cents. I remember that day going, holy shit. Yep. Where and that was the first time it had ever happened. Ever. Yeah. Ever. Yep. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, and then you see, what was it? Paulson going in to meet with all these other folks like, Oh, this is not good. Yeah. I remember it vividly. I was, yeah, I had a lot of debt. I had a bunch. I mean, I, I was, I was, I was building our portfolio and I was and, like, and, Oh my God. And what happened then is exactly what's happening right now in crypto. And so if you look back to our banking system in 2008, what we didn't realize at the time going into 2008 was how interconnected all of these banks yeah. were. So when something had some, you know, Bank of America had a uh, mortgages, obviously were the, were the root cause of all of this. So what they would do is take all of the mortgages they issued and they would package them up and called, you know, some of it was subprime, not good bank debt, right? And then they would cast it out to the street, and then J.P. Morgan investors would come in and buy it, and that was part of the capital balance sheet now at J.P. Morgan as well. And then all of a sudden you start to see it unravel here. And you go, okay, well, that line goes here and that line goes here. And that's exactly what's playing out within crypto right now. FTX melted. And then all of a sudden you see all of these other underlying companies have that FTT token on their balance sheet that was collateral. It's collateral. It's worth shit. So that doesn't exactly. mean anything at the end of the day. Exactly. So again, I think the next couple of years, again, uh, I do think indexes investing is dead when you look at kind of the comps and the comparisons. I still think probably most people should because they won't do the work. The work is hard. Uh, but do yourself a favor. Go look at Ray Dalio, Peter Lynch, Warren Buffett. Read read what they do. Understand. Because uh, I do think there's a couple of years where there'll be some there'll be the next Peter Lynch. And I think we'll yep. see that over the next couple of years. I have a bet. It won't be Kathy Wood. <laughs> we we wanted to make a bet about halfway through this year, my company. That obviously this doesn't this doesn't work. Whatever, uh, you can't do it for all reasons that are crazy. But halfway through the year, after her portfolio had been absolutely pummeled, we wanted to go out and say, "Hey, gentlemen's bet. Let's shake hands, gentlemen, gentleman, woman, whatever it is. Let's shake hands. We think our portfolio, even at this point, after you're down fifty percent, seventy percent, whatever it is, we think we'll still out outperform you by the end of the year. Going forward from that point, and we have yeah. absolutely." crushed her Rushed. on every metric that you could have looked at. Obviously, has her portfolio has continued to melt. Yeah. But to your point, yeah, just because things have gone down a lot doesn't mean they can't go down a lot more. And where can people find you? Because you put out amazing stuff every single day. Yeah, thanks so much for the kind words. We appreciate that. Find us at Life Goal Investments on Instagram, at Life Goal Investments. Thank you so much.